Good morning. Thank you guys so much for making the trek down here. I know it's freezing cold and early. Um, my name is Katie Rose. I'm our STEM program assistant here at Union Station in Science City. Thank you so much again for being here. Students, please see me after and I can stamp your notes. Um, uh, without further ado, I suppose, let me introduce our speaker today, Dr. Baki Agbas. Um, he works as a professor at the Kansas City University, and his lab does research in neuroscience and biochemistry. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Agbas. Good morning, Saturday enthusiasts. Outside is really cold and Saturday when you left everything come here uh, to learn something about my curiosity. So my beginning is starting from the uh, Asia Minor, the country named the Turkey, not Turkey anymore, Turkey. Um, so um, I have been born in the town, the circle, the name, the Erzurum. It's very ancient city. Romans built that city many, many centuries ago. And then it is a very uh, rich in terms of the culture, in terms of the archaeology. And then I've been born and then raised there. And then this is the, uh, uh, this is the town uh, that you can see. It's, uh, very mountainous, I, I'm born in the mountainous area, so when I came to Kansas, the no mountain, it's a little bit, you know, the upsetting me mm -hmm. that no mountains around. Mm -hmm. So this is a very historical city. That's what I've been born and raised and get my uh, elementary education, um, uh, then uh, college education, and then I did my master's degree there. Then I got, uh, a UNESCO fellowship to uh, to go to Hungary. It's an Eastern Europe country. So I stayed there for further education. I even completed my doctoral studies there. So now, uh, the, I was a very curious person, as my late mother saying that, grabbing everything, everything and asking, what is the name, what is the function? So I was the firstborn, so she was my first teacher. So the, my early experiments is really um, starting with the chemistry, two-color tea. My mother made this one, and I was so curious, and my jaw dropped down, that two-color tea. But that was a very interesting experiment, uh, because what she was doing here, uh, putting a lot of sugar in this uh, uh, bottom part, and then making the really concentration rich. And then gradually adding the tea on the top of it, they don't mix, because there is a gradient, concentration gradient. One of them is very heavy in sugar, the other one no sugar, they don't mix, unless you really mix it. I really learned my first chemistry class from my mother, age of probably three or four, two-color tea, concentration gradient. Then, of course, the curiosity never stops. And then we uh, have a house, the old house, that the uh, rooftop was uh, mud. So there is no kind of uh, metal things on the top of it. So a lot of other you know, ant activities. And then she was a very curious person too, and then showing me that, come here, come here, look how the ants are working. And then we were just uh, looking at, and then they are really very, very interesting animals, insects. And then I learned that uh, exemplary collaborative work for completing the task. It's very essential in science and research that you make a collaboration. So I was uh, learning from the little insect to make sure that you collaborate. And then third one, this is very funny, a fly experiment. Uh, when a fly loses its head, what happens, it can still walk and then fly for days. I was very curious, how come that the head is off and the uh, fly still can uh, survive? 
Well, in that, I'm telling this one is a kind of uh, maybe, you know, the 50 years old, maybe 50, 60 years old experiments. So there was no kind of regulation that, well, you should get the certain compliances that you perform the animal experiments. <laughs> So I learned this one later on, the flies absorb oxygen through their skin and they can live for days until they starve to death. So I learned uh, in the biology class, uh, biology experiment is very, um, you may consider very crude experiment. However, it just uh, showed me that the different organisms are living in a different way. And then, I came to uh, the uh, conclusion, well, this is a kind of recent conclusion, that uh, curiosity is a teacher of the science. If you are curious, you go forward, you learn. If you are not curious, uh, you just look at this, I'm fine, I've seen something, and that's okay. But my curiosity is just uh, forcing me to go forward, and then, Next one was the developing the, my interest in the brain biology. Brain was always fascinating. First time I saw the brain in a dish. This is a very uh, delicacy in uh, Middle Eastern countries, including Turkey. Uh, it's a brain salad, I should say. My mother was very, very skillful doing this one. We should know how to cook it. And then uh, it was good and then tasty, but they are not doing this one any longer after this um, mad cow disease pretty much threatened and then killed many people. So they are not doing this one any longer just because they're uh, curious. But when I was eating that dish, this fascinating structure of the brain, my mother was trying to explain me this one, but she was not schooled. However, she was trying to explain that, okay, this is, you know, the folded, and, and that's what you are talking, thinking, or singing, or you're seeing. Everything is, is just happening here. And then, uh, well, that's very cool, but uh, uh, my um, uh, further experiences in the brain biology took place in Hungary when I was doing uh, my doctoral studies. We were working on the, uh, the uh, brain of the frog. This is a frog. And then uh, this small brain uh, that is circle in the red, that's what we were harvesting, comparing to the size of the frog and size of the brain, the remaining is waste. Uh, my lab mates next day, I don't know, it was a kind of delicacy in Hungary, and I was not very familiar. They prepared the uh, uh, frog legs, fried frog legs, and then they had a feast. I was, of course, uh, refraining not to eat. They forced me to eat, but I didn't because I knew what I was dealing with. But that's how the brain uh, biology attracted me to dive into the more uh, into it. And then, uh, then I, I studied, uh, for example, in the getting the chicken embryo, um, harvesting the embryo. This is the original writing from my notebook. I think it's going to be historically important for me. <laughs> Um, then uh, we harvested uh, the chicken embryo um, uh, from the egg and uh, put in the dish and provide the certain foods and then con uh, conditions. And after a couple of days, as you can see, then uh, we had uh, several uh, stages of the neuronal cell growing and then they are making the connections. For example, that is the very early stage, uh, this pointer is not working, unfortunately, one day, and then it's growing, growing. Look at this one in the 28 days, uh, that neurons are making the more connections. Neurons are very, very um, uh, interesting uh, cells that, that they are elect electrically charged and then they make uh, communication and connections. So that is uh, continuing on this, then, uh, uh, there is a kind of um, 
the notion is that the bringing the research to the bedside, so whatever we are discovering in the lab, we should just bring to the, the public benefit, like uh, for example, uh, treatment of the diseases or diagnosis of the diseases. And these slides, uh, let me get this one. Okay, this, this slide uh, shows that there are uh, neurodegenerative diseases and then these are uh, very vicious and then almost uh, uh, all of them are untreatable. Um, then um, we have to uh, define the way that to diagnose the neurodegenerative disease earlier. Can I get this one? Sorry. Okay, so these are the common neurodegenerative diseases. Alzheimer's disease, everybody knows. Parkinson's disease, Huntington amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and multiple sclerosis. And I, my interest is mostly concentrated on the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and Alzheimer's diseases. So what are the causative neurodegener uh, causes of the neurodegenerative diseases? Age is important. Well, let's just face it, we are aging all the time. Every day we are aging. Yesterday we were one day younger, so today, today we are one day older. So age is a single important uh, causative effect uh, developing the neurodegenerative disease. Genetics and environmental factors can contribute to their development as well. For example, um, one of the uh, pesticides that we are using in our garden or um, in, in the farmers are using later in the life and they develop the Parkinson's disease. So uh, this is an environmental factors. And then also mechanical forces, boxers for example, Muhammad Ali uh, had a Parkinson's disease but he was a professional boxer on his life so the repeated hit on the brain, head, and later on he uh, developed uh, the Parkinson's disease. The genetic part of the neurodegenerative disease are very uh, small, about the 10 percent, 10 or 15 percent. Remaining is very sporadic and we don't know what the cause is. And a common way that the neurons are damaged or destroyed uh, through the build up the proteins in central nervous system, what is called the plux, protein plux. So let's give me the, some sort of inographic. Uh, the Alzheimer disease kills more than both cancer combined, breast cancer and then prostate cancer. So it's very uh, important that we need to uh, tackle with the problem. The other one, that between the 2000 and the 2019, that's from the Alzheimer's disease increased 145% and it's increasing. It's, it's really increasing if you are, I mean, we are working day and night, but uh, the rate of the uh, disease is increasing. And for the uh, ALS, uh, it's more vicious uh, after the doctor diagnoses the patient that, yeah, you got an ALS two to five years, that's the life. That after two to five years, everything is collapsing and the patient dies. So we have no way to rescue them. There are some drug treatment that provides maybe a couple of months that you can, the patient can see the graduation of their grandchildren or, 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 the, or the wedding of their children or something like that, but not more than that. So what happens that, as you can see in this one, uh, in the Alzheimer's disease, the brain shrinks, okay? Now, the, here is the healthy brain. Okay, this is the healthy brain, as you can see, the nice and the round. And now the Alzheimer's disease brain, you can see very easily that uh, things are shrinking. There are more vacuoles, uh, you know, the empty spaces, uh, then the brain is just a shrinking. If the brain is shrinking, it doesn't function well. Once symptoms develop, it can be too late uh, to treat a neurodegenerative disease because we just missed the, uh, uh, the window of opportunity for the treatment. So therefore, it's very essential, very essential for the neurodegenerative disease to catch the disease at early age. 
early stage. And then, uh, so how can we diagnose the neurodegenerative disease sooner? Well, it's in the skull, right? You can't just cut open and then poke and then get the brain tissue and then put under the scope and then uh, look at them what's, what's going on. Probably in the late stage and they can do, but there are some more uh, sophisticated imaging uh, the uh, techniques that uh, they can really make a picture and then image for the brain and then see what's the problem, but they are very invasive and also expensive. So we are looking for the something cheap, something doable, feasible, and yet an informative. Okay, so then we need to develop the, some sort of biomarkers. So biomarkers uh, uh, is a kind of biomolecules that we are looking and chasing their, um, uh, the, uh, their development uh, or, or, or their pattern or profile, then we can have some idea about the prognosis of the disease. And then it can be uh, the molecular on a radiographic or histo histological or physiological. So the biomarker is a measurable indicator that is used to understand what's going on in the body. And then it's really very helpful for the clinicians to have a tool that they can monitor the disease or if they are starting for the um, their treatment uh, regimen that they can continue whether the treatment is working or not. Okay, so what if we could detect, uh, uh, if you could detect what is occurring in your brain by analyzing uh, your blood? Blood is a peripheral juice that everybody has it. And then, uh, so uh, this is an artist illustration that that is the blood vessel and then this inside is the, the, uh, the uh, blood cells, erythrocytes you can see, and then outside is the astrocytes. So, the, this one, is the circular one, is the blood-brain barrier. It's very tight. It's very tight, it's very difficult to, uh, to penetrate, it's very selective. But however, if you can see what's going on in the central nervous system, and it can be reflected in the blood, so that uh, the scientists or researchers can analyze that uh, biomarkers or biomolecules to have an idea what is going on the neuronal cells. Okay, so now scientists have found that biomarkers in blood platelets may mirror those found in cells of the brain. So this is very cool. This is the uh, left-hand side that you can see the neuronal cells and uh, there are, uh, th this one is the part of the brain, okay? But uh, uh, what is going to happen in the neuronal cells can be reflected in the bloodstream. So the blood cells will pick up uh, the biomolecules and then we can measure them. So it's very easy to get the blood, right? And uh, rather than uh, either the getting the biopsy from brain or going to the very uh, expensive uh, imaging uh, techniques. All right, so uh, what is the platelet? And the platelet is this guy saying the platelet, it looks like a very amorph shape, but actually this is an unactivated one. When it's not unactivated, it's a very disc shaped like. And then this in the middle, the white blood cells, that leukocytes that, uh, you know, they're very important for the inflammation. And the red blood cells that uh, everybody knows, the red blood cells, erythrocytes, it's a red color. It carries the nutrient and the oxygen to the tissues. So how the blood platelets comes? Uh, blood platelets is originating from the bone marrow. There is a mother cell named the megakaryocytes and then this one, it gives the, uh, the stem cells and the white blood cells emerges. So uh, these are the red blood cells and then platelets, and then that is what we are interested in to, uh, studying on the platelets, because it's easy to get it and it's very uh, available for us. Okay, so uh, you need basically just a, nine milliliter on 10 milliliter blood intravenous and punctured. It's a little big 
and you got you know the blood, and we have a really a uh, lot of uh, studies to we can perform. Um, the, there are benefits for the doing the uh, platelets. Uh, it's a minimally invasive. That's the Im invasiveness. You, know, you got that, and a minimal pain, inexpensive. It's very cheap, and it allows for repeated sampling over time. And then it's, it can be also done in the rural area rather than coming to the major city to get your test being done. Okay, so why blood platelets? Both neurons and then blood platelets contain similar cellular machinery and the structure. Okay, look at this one. Uh, this is an activated platelet, uh, and then this little uh, processes, pro processes are just look like uh, dendritic processes in the neurons, just the little tentacles that communicating to one another. And then also there are some more sciencey heavy stuff that the, uh, uh, the common points with the uh, uh, platelets and then synapse and then brain and then blood. And then um, you can, you know, to quickly you know, to browse that there are many molecular resemblance that they, they carry. And then also they have um, uh, the functions that they are very similar. Not exactly the same, of course, but they are very similar. So we thought that, okay, if this is the case, then probably we can study uh, the platelets to understand what's going on in neurodegenerative diseases. We are not making the, the conclusions, but we, are, we can understand what is happening in the brain. So now, if the further analysis and further tests need to be done, so it can be done justifiably, right? Rather than, oh, okay, I forgot the something, well, let's get the PET scan. Oh, well, you know, the PET scan, you know, I don't know, five, ten thousand dollars I think you are okay, you know. Well, okay, $10,000 is just a gun. Rather than looking at the blood test and then see what is going on. If something is really interesting and very peculiar, then you can go to the next step and the next step and the next step. So we thought that probably it will help for clinical trials. It will help for uh, the, uh, uh, the physicians to make a kind of... Uh, uh, diagnosis uh, the more more justifiably. Okay, so uh, my interest, my laboratory interest is uh, the concentrated on the protein named the TDP43. We thought that probably TDP43 is a potential biomarker to chase for both the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and an Alzheimer's disease. And why blood platelets in terms of the TDP43? TDP43, a protein related to a neurodegenerative disease, can be found in the platelets, number one. That's cool. And then next one is the lifespan of the platelet is short, 8 to 12 days, or 8 to 10 days, 10 to 12 days, depending on the conditions, which allows us to study, study the current status of the TDP43. It's a kind of snapshot, okay? Today you are doing this way, 10 days you are doing this way, and in one month your disease is progressed because TDP43 accumulation is really high. So it's, it gives a kind of really nice tool to study this particular protein. And then we can easily study the cellular process, uh, processes responsible for the breakdown of the removal of the TDP43. So, um, uh, what is TDP43? It's, uh, it's a little heavy in science, try to make it more simplified. And a protein that normally found in the nucleus cells where it regulates many cellular processes. But the beauty of that, it resides in the uh, neuro, uh, um, nucleus, but it also shuttles to the cytosol outside of the nucleus. So it's a shuttling back and forth, back and forth. But when the disease occurs, this one stays in the cytosol more, longer. And that is not good, because it should go back to the nucleus. That is the, what the place is. When it stays in the, in the cytosol, uh, it gets the, uh, the heavily um, the change, what we call it the post-translational modification. It does a lot of you know, the phosphorylation of phosphate groups that decorates and then it becomes more uh, toxic, and then it forms the plaque, 
not only it forms the plug, but it becomes a toxic and then can go and then infect other cells too. Okay, how is the TDP43 related to neurodegenerative disease? It's a mislocalization within the cells, as I mentioned that uh, place is the, uh, the, uh, the nucleus, but it stays in the cytosol, it's a mislocalization. It should briefly go there, finish the job, and then come back, but it stays longer. And an over-concentration in the cells. When it doesn't come to its, uh, its base, and then it becomes and a more, uh, uh, more and a more, and it forms the, uh, the plaque. Uh, then the uh, third one is the cell-to-cell -cell infection. Uh, it's very interesting that I came to know that TDP43 has a, like a prion-like feature. Prion, cause, prion is a protein that causes the, uh, the Metcalf disease, Metcalf disease. So prion goes from one cell to another cell and infect them. TDP43 does the same thing. It's like a, you know, the infecting the other cells. It is more illustration what I said. Uh, that is what it stays in the cell. It comes to the cytosol. When it doesn't go back to the base, it forms the plug. And then this plug eventually kills the, uh, the neurons. And then cytoplasmic TDP43 protein aggregation uh, in spinal cord motor neurons. This one was taken from the Alzheimer's disease patients. Then uh, here is the left-hand side. You can see the TDP43 uh, staining. And then in the middle, and a phosphorylated TDP43 uh, staining. Now it's getting more and more because it's more phosphorylated, more decorated with the uh, phosphate groups. And then here is the, another one, the very dark brown, means that, uh, okay, cell is uh, pretty much hopeless to survive. It's going to die. Okay, so the cell-to-cell -cell infection, uh, as I mentioned, that TDP43 has a, a prion-like uh, feature, prion-like feature. And this feature um, makes the TDP43 a potential uh, infectious material. It's like a, it's not a virus, it's a protein, but it has an ability to infect the uh, normal cells. When the uh, cells are dead and then ruptured, of course, and then if getting this free, the TDP43 goes the nearby cells and then infect them. So if we monitor the disease progression, what is the TDP43 profile, then we can catch the, uh, this, um, uh, the vicious cycle at the early stage. Either we can remove them or we can block them, or we can somehow uh, guide them, hey guys, you need to go to nucleus because it has a kind of uh, um, nucleus recognition sequence that goes in that is lost in the disease condition. Okay, what we found, what we found, our finding is that in our research, we have identified that disease-specific antibodies that can recognize modified forms of the biomarker protein TDP43 in a patient's blood platelets. So getting the blood plate, blood, and then isolating the platelets is very easy, cost-effective, and reproducible. So we can do that. And then we found that, that's very interesting, 95% of the plasma TDP43, this protein, okay, is found in the platelets. So 95% of the plasma, plasma has, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the platelets, and then, 95% is in there. So that just uh, really strengthened our hand to study the platelet biology in neurodegenerative disease. We are learning a lot of things. We are really, um, every day is uh, a new day for us to learn and get excitement for the, um, for the, for the development of the, uh, of, the, of the disease. So now we are collaborating with the international consortium, one in Switzerland, one in Italy, two in the United States. We all four laboratories are working really very hard 
to find out the uh, best antibody. Antibody, you know the antibody. It's a kind of molecule that recognizes the proteins. It's itself protein. I find out the best antibodies that can be used in clinical trials or even in the treatment. So we are at the very beginning of the stage, but we are all excited to go to lab every day, Saturday, Sunday, and then try to find out the, uh, the, the more information that we learn and then community learn and then uh, the patients will get benefit, hopefully. Okay, application, what we can do for an application. Currently, we are studying the profile of the platelet TDP43, uh, AD, Alzheimer's disease, and then ALS. And then def definitely developing the biomarkers-based platelets will assist clinicians in diagnosing the Alzheimer's disease as well as the ALS disease at early age. If we can catch the disease before the clinical symptom sets on, we have a chance, actually, to treat that. But once it's already off the hand, uh, the uh, protein aggregation just going on, um, aggregation removal system is blocked, called the autophagy or the proteasomes. And then it's very difficult to really clean up. These are the insoluble plugs. You can't do that one. But if you can get the early stage, and that's cool, then you can develop the new drug that we'll take care of, or the, you can, uh, we can uh, the find out the way to locate the TDP43 from cytoplasm to the nucleus. So then the, uh, at least that uh, disease progress will be slowed down. We may not be able to 100% cure at this moment. However, we may be able to reduce the progression of the disease. Can you imagine? Uh, the ALS patient is living, you know, the, let's say 15 years rather than the two to five years. Or Alzheimer's uh, uh, progress is uh, pretty much postponed instead of the forgetting the where did I put my key or the what, what am I looking at or uh, I don't remember the certain words. And then at the age of, you know, the 60, 65, maybe this can be occur, you know, the 80, 85, or who knows. So that's really essential to catch the disease in a timely manner. Now we need the biomarkers to monitor the disease progress. Okay, so now these are all curiosity uh, driven research, starting from making the uh, two color tea, looking at the brain, harvesting the frog brain, growing them in the dish, all the way doing the human based studies, all driven by the curiosity. As uh, Albert Einstein said, I have no special talent. And I believe he is not a talented person. However, I am only passionately curious. The important thing is not stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. And in another quote, he says that it's not that I am smart. I just stay with the problems longer longer, that's the important thing. What happened next, what happened next? That's the, really the curiosity driven uh, research. And then all I wanted to say for the young scientist uh, candidates that uh, always keep your um, curiosity uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of very active way. Reading, writing, coming this kind of Saturday seminars, or finding out the uh, summer research, uh, you know, the, the research laboratories. We have a major uh, universities in the Kansas City area. Uh, try to feed your curiosity. Try to feed your curiosity. See, we are getting old, and then we will be soon either to retire or to die or something like You will be the flag carrier. You will be the flag carrier. So this is the something that I am transferring what I learned to you then you'll be the next generation of the scientist that will carry for the next step of the development of the disease uh, treatment for these very vicious neurodegenerative diseases. Okay, so these are uh, the, my slide. This is my team, Team Q. Q stands for the quality. Actually, I didn't intend to put the name, but uh, somehow the students figured out that. So this is the summer 2022. And then these are all uh, medical students, 
as well as the College of Bioscience students are coming and working in my lab. We, also, uh, we are also working to get the high school students to work during the summer time. So we are working some sort of you know, the paper, progress, uh, pa paper process to make sure that everything is compliant with. And then, um, so now I think that uh, I am done with my talk. Then I will stop here, and if you have a curious question, this is the time to ask. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Any questions? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, have you, I imagine, I'm guessing if you've taken blood from normal people with Alzheimer's, have you found that the levels of human, in the platelets of how much human... P43, yeah. P4, P4. Yeah, it is high. It is high in the Alzheimer patients as well as the ALS patients that this uh, platelet TDP43 biomarker levels are high. Yes. Have you found a point between like the normal, like where you would find it? Uh huh. That yeah. I see, I see. Well, you know, for this one, we need to really uh, study a massive number of the patients. For example, I was looking at the uh, glucometer uh, that, uh, well, we are saying this one based on the three, four hundred patients screened and get the normal, okay? But we are looking at the profile rather than the amount, like, uh, okay, your TDP40 level is the one picogram per milliliter blood. We are not at this stage, we are uh, working on this one. However, we are looking at the profile, what this profile says. Or in Alzheimer's disease, it's really very high, or ALS in very high. And then in the normal, is, uh, you can still see it, because TDP43 is normal protein, actually. We, we have that one. We can't really exclude from our circulation. However, in disease condition is abnormally high, and then also get the, the most uh, modifications, what we call the post-translation modifications. Another question, this light is just taking my eye, I can't see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely, please. Okay, okay, TDP43 is a nuclear protein, it resides in the nucleus. But it has also ability to go to cytosol because it is also RNA binding protein. It helps for the RNA to function, okay? It's a transcription factor, actually. It also binds to DNA too in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the nucleus. But it has a kind of segment that a kind of uh, ticket that, okay, I'm done, I'm getting back to my base, which is nucleus. If this segment is lost or the modified, it can't go inside of the nucleus because the nucleus is a very selective. Hey, this is a kind of, you know, the brain of the cell. So you are not, you know, they freely come and in and out. And it doesn't come inside, it stays on outside. Well, that's not the stay, uh, place that the TDP43 should stay. And when it stays in the cytosol or outside of the nucleus, it gets more modifications. When it gets more modifications, increase modifications, it forms the plaque. Questions? Yes, on the back. Well, that is a very, very intriguing question. Um, we didn't study the MS, what happens to the MS. We, we focused at this moment the Alzheimer's and then ALS. I'm trying to get the Parkinson patients. It's very difficult you know, for me to get the samples because I have to go to KU Medical Center and then literally you know, to bag the samples. Well, it's not that easy. You have to go to paper process, make sure that everything is compliant, in compliance. Uh, but it, it is possible because TDP43 is a very universal, but I never looked at uh, any kind of uh, pattern change or profile change in the NMS. But it's a very good question, thank you. Yes.
Of course, yes, there are absolutely A beta and then tau, phosphorylated tau, because these are the two A beta, uh, amyloid beta uh, fragments like a 142 and 140. That's very, you know, the pretty gold standard, I should say. Range, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, definitely, this is the only one protein that they're looking at. However, yeah, no, you just make me talk. <laughs> However, there is a one uh, thought that I am thinking and I'm working on it. Maybe TDP43 caused the A beta fragmentation. A beta is the amyloid beta. When it got fragmented, 142, 140, it becomes in a toxic polypeptides. And that's the, one of the hallmark of the Alzheimer's. And then uh, thinking that probably a TDP43 increased the beta secretase enzyme. That enzyme chops off the A beta whole protein and generates the fragments like A beta 40, A beta 142. And then these polypeptides, you know, the, accumulates over the time and then forms the plaque. But I don't know the relationship between the TDP43 and the phosphorylated tau. Uh, it might be because the TDP43 has about the 36 potential phosphorylation site. If it gets hyperphosphorylated, maybe interacts with the tau and then have the tau be phosphorylated. I mean, at this moment, it's really pretty much, you know, the uh, over in the cloud and then not much experimental uh, data that I have. But it is possible. But I agree with you that it's on not only one protein, it's a profile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have been trying this one for uh, quite a bit, uh, quite a long time. Actually, I uh, submitted in a patent application, but it was not issued. Um, not any time soon, but uh, first of all, we have to understand the biology of the TDP43 and then how this one is really um, the advancing the Alzheimer's and as well as the ALS. But as soon as the, you know, the, these things are done and scientifically approved and the scientific society, you know, they embrace them and, you know, okay them. And then developing the the uh, commercial kit is not that difficult. It's super easy, but uh, we have to first of all make sure that uh, what we are saying is uh, correct and then true. But I think we are getting there, one, one step at a time. Yes. Oh, we have a very cool system. We have a very cool system. Uh, we have a, my postdoctoral associate, Dr. Purva Sethi, is in the audience, and then she does that one. We have a little, um, I call it the little giant. It, it, it's called a capillary electrophoretic immunoassay. So all we do, we just uh, put the sample, the platelet samples, cytosol samples in the wells, 24 wells, and then we put the, you know, the antibody, okay? And then we just put the machine. What the machine does, that the antibody recognizes the, uh, let's say, TDP43, right? Because it's a recognition site. And then second antibody has a tag, label, chemiluminescence label. It recognizes the first antibody on the tail. So you have a kind of complex. And then uh, there's an optic system and then measures the chemiluminescence and then you are looking at the, oh boy, the signal level is very high, so which means that it's relevant to the uh, amount of the TDP43 in the samples. So that's called it the immunoassay. Classically, it's known like, you know, the STS gel electrophoresis or Western blood or immunoblood. And this is very time consuming. It takes about the three and a half days so we just squeeze with this methodology three and a half days into three and a half hours to get the actual data. Yeah, it's basically chemiluminescence based. The antibody recognizes the proteins because uh, they raise this antibody against that protein. 
Another questions or yeah <laughs> sorry, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, the AI, yeah, I like the technology. Uh, I have a kind of uh, AI in my computer. I am asking the question. Uh, AI gives the answer. I thought, well, I think in my, in, you know, the, in my knowledge, uh, this is not correct. What do you think? So, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Next time I will make a <laughs> correction. <laughs> So AI is very good, definitely, for the data processing, and then major uh, universities or major systems are doing that. And yeah, I mean, in future, definitely, you know, absolutely. You just get the drop of blood and I put in the things. AI will just tell you all sorts of things what I said to you. Yeah, I mean, it's a little scary, but I think it's a future. Yeah. Yeah, oh, there are many laboratories, yeah. That's what I said that, you know, uh, we have a col uh, consortium collaboration, the four laboratories in international, one in Italy, one in Switzerland, and two of them are, one of them is in Arizona in Kansas City. So we are doing this, but uh, there are other laboratories in the, um, in the United States, but uh, uh, I don't want to brag about, but uh, probably we are, the, I think the few, one of the few laboratories are working on the platelet platelet biology in neurodegenerative diseases. That's really cool. If we can really uh, solidify this one, that will open up the many, many, many uh, avenues to, to study the neurodegenerative disease. Because it's a platelet distance, so now instead of the working the neurons and the tissue, it's much more you know, the straight. Why I'm doing that one? Because it's less invasive. For example, um, to getting the spinal cord fluid, you need to get the lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture is very, very, very invasive. You get the huge needle and then poke in your spinal cord and then suck out the, um, the, uh, the spinal uh, uh, cord fluid uh, and then the, to study. But instead, instead, we are doing this one in the blood. You know, Every year you go once in a year in, the, uh, in your primary care physician for the well-being studies. What they do, they just poke in and get the 10 milliliter of the blood. And then they do all sort of lipid profile, metabolic profile, and this one and that one. That's the pain that you, what you get. And it's very easy and repeated. If I'm coming the next time, all right, I, uh, I need to, you know, the, let's say every two months and I need to get the blood. It's very easy. Two months, you already forgot the pain of the, you know, the first one. So now uh, that's, uh, that's also helping uh, for, uh, for scientists uh, to make uh, the much more swift analysis and much more easy analysis and cost effective. It's, it's not that really expensive. Any questions? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, but the, for the, for the, for example, Alzheimer's disease and ALS, genetic component is very little, five, 10, or if stretch, you know, the 15%. So for example, um, the uh, Alzheimer's disease, APOE4 uh, uh, genetic mutation is the main cause that anybody whose grandfather or grandma or mother has the APOE4 uh, gene uh, modification in their, uh, in their diagnosis, the most likely the offsprings will have the same because they inherit it. But the 90, 90, 95% of the both Alzheimer's and then ALS and sporadic, we don't know the cause. For example, in first Gulf War, uh, the soldiers came back from Middle East and then all of a sudden, ALS development incidents just shoot up. Department of Defense didn't know what's happening, what's going on, why they developed an ALS. And then they poured out millions and the millions of the dollars to 
understand that why they have that one. I actually applied the one, but I didn't get the grant. Uh, so yeah, I mean, environmental factor, for example. Environmental factor. You know, the stress conditions in the battlefield, environmental factors. Some people say that there are certain bacteria that are specific for the deserted area. I don't know that one. And, um, but the, my thing is that um, weapons, you know, the zinc material, um, the element zinc is very much, you know, the used in the, in, the, in the weaponry. So in an explosion, who knows, you know, you got the zinc, uh, you know, the, from earth or from your food, that's okay, we need that one. But we get an excessive one, what happens? We don't know. And they still don't know why these soldiers develop the ALS. Most likely they say that stress, because this is stress is also one of the factors. Yeah, it's not that easy to be in the front line. But the most of the, it is sporadic. Genetic is known, I mean, you know that one, and then you can't really help on it, unless others why do, do, you do the CRISPR, uh, you know, the treatment, and uh, to recover those, uh, the patients. But the majority of them, all of a sudden, you know, uh, you got the Alzheimer's disease. It's very scary. A professor like myself, and then lecturing, and all of a sudden went to blank. Nothing, okay, and then they just uh, hospitalized him and then they diagnosed him that, okay, I think that he has an Alzheimer's disease. It's scary. So we need to look at, you know, the more, you know, the sporadic and find out the causes, genetic causes. We know the genetic causes, but environmental causes and then some other causes. So, yeah, it requires a lot of work. So we need the public trust and the public help write up the letters to the Congress that, okay, increase the NIH grant, NIH budget. Yes? I don't know, I just uh, blurt it out, you know. <laughs> you know, we scientists are always, you know, the something that, you know, I'm talking, I don't know what am I talking, you know, that you are thinking something just to come into your mouth. I mean, it's possible. And it's possible that, okay, find out, uh, you know, the problematic place. Now the technology is available, you know. So. Any questions? Do not hesitate. Yeah, absolutely, please. Yes. First of all, um, the uh, brain cells is very oxygenated cells. They need the oxygen. They need the oxygen. And then, of course, the energy is provided by beloved organelle, the mitochondria. I love this organelle that I have a pin on my, on my label. So you need the oxygen. Uh, definitely exercise is providing the, uh, the oxygen uh, to whole entire body, including the brain, number one. Number two, neuronal cells are electrogenic uh, cells. They're, they're, they're working with the electricity. They make a connection, they make an electricity. What we call it the firing, okay? So when you are solving the Sudoku, or when you are doing the crosswords, or something, then what happens, your brains are making the firing. They are active, they don't sit. They are not the potato coach. But if you are watching the television and then staring or something like that, they are in the basal level. They don't do anything, a little bit, you know, the blip here, blip there. But when you are forcing yourself doing the, for example, mathematical calculations or um, the uh, reading, for example, and then um, uh, Sudoku solving or any kind of you know, the things that requires the brain, that really helps, that really helps. 1975, there was a study uh, conducted in University of Kansas Lawrence campus. They call it the nun study. You know, the nuns, these uh, Christian sisters, 
uh, uh, they keep the diary every day. At the end of the day, using the real uh, fountain pen and ink and then real paper and then writing them, writing on, on, the, on this paper what has happened for kind of daily reflection. And then they keep that one, okay? That's a tradition. And then these nuns, these nuns live the more than 100 years. 100, 100, 100, 100 98. And they were just wondering, why you know, the nuns are living longer? It turns out that this writing, writing exercise is keeping the brain neurons fired always in an active because you are thinking what I'm going to write. And then you are writing, okay, if this writing correct, correcting and you know, erasing, writing the right word. So keeping the brain active is essentially important, super important for the Alzheimer's disease. But the, for ALS, there is no such kind of thing. It's a muscular, neuromuscular disease. When it sets, and then that's pretty much you know, the end, two to five years. Stephen Hopkins lived longer, 80, what, 88 or 83, and then, but he had a rare form of the ALS. He had a neuromuscular disease, but not the popular that what we have. It has a rare uh, ALS uh, disease. For the ALS, no matter how many Sudoku you, you do it, and then it doesn't really help because the, the connection between the muscles and neurons are disconnected. So that's what the nail is. So, um, you know, the probably, that's what the early diagnosis is very important. If they, if the clinician will catch the early uh, ALS in an early, maybe uh, they develop a new drug that will work. But if it is too late, and no matter how, what drug you are using, it will not really work. How the drugs are working, mostly the antibody-based, now you are making them more talk, uh, drug-based, that these are the antibodies, then recognizing the protein and then removing. But where they go? They go to the machinery named the proteasome. Proteasome is like a, a, a kitchen food processor, you know. Uh, underneath of your sink. Um, and then you got the, you know, the, all the scraps of the food and I put them and turn on and then it just grinds them and that's fun. But uh, in ALS and in Alzheimer's, actually, we had a very preliminary study, very preliminary study, not the detailed study, very preliminary study, that this proteasome activity is also uh, pretty much overwhelmed. Well, you have a more aggregated proteins are coming Okay, your antibody is recognizing, the, removing them. And where they are going? They are going to proteasome or autophagy system, but it's overwhelmed. Too many things are coming. So therefore, uh, anybody who is studying, uh, including us, uh, working on the uh, protein aggregation phenomenon in the neurodegenerative disease, we should also consider uh, that the removal system, clinic system, how they are doing. What's their status? It's a whole system, really. You look at the human body is a very wonderful, very marvelous system. That uh, each time when I'm, you know, the looking at the issue, it just uh, brings me to the different realm. It just uh, works in a many faceted way. It's not that okay. Now you got the uh, the TDP43, for example, aggregated, and then you got the LS, but what's happening, what other machineries are really uh, halted or uh, uh, congested or something like that. But definitely exercise and then brain activity, reading. You know, nowadays uh, reading is gone almost. Done? Thank you so much. Dr. Agbaz, it's a fascinating talk. And we appreciate you all for coming down again, and we hope you'll join us for our future seminars. You can find them on our Science City website under Student Programs, and I will meet you out front to stamp your notes. Thank you so much. <laughs>